It's another waking day in business in Nairobi's thriving slum, Kibera. Hosting a population of about a million people, Kibera grapples with staggering levels of unemployment, amongst other social evils. But even amidst such odds, a small and silent business is taking root. This is the transformation of waste bone products into accessories sold at well above 2,000 shillings. It isn't common knowledge that this is what many young men in Kibera depend on for their daily earnings. And therefore, using skills they've mastered over time and the desperate need to make an extra shilling, they work to create high value from a completely filthy waste product. Kibera is home to three such micro-industrial centers, each with about 50 workshops and 10 informal showrooms. The bone business is common in Kibera because uh, this is the uh, uh, origin of it, its production. Uh, like I said, it started way back in uh, early 80s and uh, the, major, the, the major place was in Kibera. And uh, it has helped translate, I mean, the livelihood of so many in Kibera. Every day, each of the determined young men walking into these tiny dust street and workshops is driven by the discovery of the real value of leftover bones which only takes a few hours of carving, brushing, polishing and coloring to translate into hard currency. Here in Kibera, the bone art field has employed uh, most of the uh, idol guys about uh, over 300 uh, people uh, that is uh, avoiding them from engaging uh, into dirty activities like uh, taking drugs or maybe just idling and doing uh, things that are not I mean uh, constructive to themselves bone craftsmen are quite particular about the type and source of the bone required to facilitate their job the degree to which a bone is firm or brittle is key in deciding what artifact to make out of it. In general, however, all bone products have a fairly long lifeline. The bone materials are locally sourced, and uh, we normally have the stockies, the guys who are normally stock them here. Most specifically, we've got the camel and the cow bone. Uh, the cow bone goes uh, for about uh, 20 shillings per piece and uh, the camel bone goes for about 100 shillings per piece. With fluctuating returns and unpredictable market forces, workshop owners like Louise have to be calculative about how they run their crafting businesses. Mostly the type of work we are doing depends on the season. When the season is high, you can as well uh, have more than even four people. Um, and. Uh, during the low season, uh, it also have its own repercussions on it. In this small shanty town of sorts, most of the young men dealing in bones were initially employed in workshops similar to those they now own. Wakati nilianza kufanya yangu, nikaanza kutafuta wa customers. Wakati nilianza kupata wa customers, nikapata kama kuna faida kwa hii kasi. Hii kasi... Naweza sema ni kazi nzuri kwa sababu inatusaidia. Tuna, tunaona ya kwamba tunafanya vitu mingi kupitia hii kazi. Unaishi na familia yako, unalepa school fees kwa watoto, unalepa nyumba, hiyo ndio chakula inatoka kwa hii kazi. Kwa hiyo mi naweza sema ya kwamba hii kazi ni mzuri kwa sababu inafanya 1, 2, 3. Ambayo kama umeketi wesi ukapata. For a business that mainly involves taking bones through a kind of crucible, bone crafting can at times reap significantly high benefits. On a good day it works on, uh, it translates to good money. Like uh, per month you can as well generate like 60, 50 to 60,000 shillings. Yeah. And also to work continuously with different people, not only one entity. Yeah. 
Such benefits, however, do not come by easily. They call for skillful application of the resources at hand. First, the bones are cut into small sizable pieces and the fatty marrow is then exposed. Thereafter, the bone is chiseled and carved to do away with the top layer. The craftsman then proceeds to lead the piece into a preferred shape, which then he places under a polishing motor to bring out a subtle shine before coloring. After making the patterns, now it goes to another process of uh, dyeing it or maybe putting color on it. And for this one, we are using a certain chemical called uh, potassium permanganate. Now, uh, the last stage of it is uh, polishing to make it a complete end product. The polishing makes it uh, uh, shiny and makes it uh, look attractive. Just as is the case in most other trades in the informal sector, bone crafting is faced with a distinct challenge that inevitably comes with the job. In this case, dust. Uh, the challenges of which we normally face is uh, maybe lack of awareness in most cases like I said yesterday. Because you find that most of the guys whom you are working with are not aware of the effect of dust. And, uh, competition amongst the producers themselves because you find that most of the guys normally sell their products locally so that one makes uh, uh, the product to flood the market uh, before you get something that can uh, uh, get you uh, to another stage headed for foreign markets these brilliantly crafted artifacts are going to need a heavier push than just the enthusiasm of these skilled craftsmen. I think uh, so far the government, uh, through the Ministry of uh, Tourism, and uh, also maybe industrialization, should come in and uh, start exposing this as one of the identities or cultural identity amongst the Luo community. Especially the guys who started uh, making it, especially from the Suba community. And uh, because they've made it to be seen in the outside world. And uh, locally it's not recognized much. Yeah, you find that uh, in some cases uh, maybe tourists normally come as far as from western parts of the world. And just coming to visit us here, whereby even one of the government uh, representatives through uh, these various ministries, have not even made any attempt to come and uh, uh, visit one of the sites which this production uh, or these artists are making their production. And now, from the depths of this sore slum Kibera, the finished products locked up in waiting in these dark lit informal showrooms are now bound for bigger markets, thus a significant markup in price can be expected. Big exporters like Strebel are quite keen to point out the real value of finished bone products. Bone craft is extremely viable because it's a byproduct, isn't it? And everybody, you know, human beings eat meat and it's a byproduct of, of, of meat and it's a domestic animal. So there's always going to be bone available. So, you know, the, the material is there and, um, and the market is there because it does sell very well products made from bone, whether it's spoons or jewellery or pots, sell very well to tourists and to local markets as well. While some bone products find their way into shelves and cupboards within the domestic market, an almost equal appreciation is held by tourist buyers. My main market is to um, the tourist market, so eventually it's an export, you know, for the bone products made here. and. Um, Though there is a local market, but tourists do tend to like bone simply because it is so unique to Africa and, you know, specifically here in Kenya. So a lot of, a lot of these products are bought by tourists and then exported out. In a market increasingly swelling with suppliers, bone crafting may be a bit injured by the lack of a more creative genius in design. As a, as a wholesale supplier, we sell so much bone products 
but what's missing I feel is the creativity of we have a lot of creative people here in Kenya but they do tend you know bone products tend to um, get repeated and there's no new styles and um, you know different different designs coming up so it misses um, it misses people having the confidence to just do something different. Now, the products that began their cycle in the depths of dump sites and garbage bins finally make it into high-end open-air markets where both domestic and foreign buyers are not scarce. On Wednesdays, the best day we do business. Because here, yeah, you know, the area is very good with the tourists. Also, we have wanted uh, an advertisement of the, the tours. So, like Wednesdays, we can sell like 200 pieces, each costing 800. Now, with a new government in place and job creation remaining high on the agenda, the government and various stakeholders ought to step in by formalizing bone crafting and subsidizing it as a major contributor to the tourism market. And maybe then, will bone crafting be seen as the business it really is? Operating in silence, it's a low-cost, high-value business offering jobs to thousands and moving the economy forward.